Welcome back. Some people love history. They love to read about it, research it, learn all there is to know about certain time periods or portions of the world as it unfolds. Those are great ways to learn more about an interest. However, there are, they're not the only way or the ultimate way to approach a passion for the past. Sometimes, if you truly want to know a subject really, really well, you have to experience it. For Sam Gallion, a senior at Boyd, the knowledge of the war between the states ignited into a thrilling real-life lesson as he entered the enthralling world of Civil War reenactments. Sam joins us now to share about being a living historian. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Well, it's, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you, We've kind of talked about how I, when I worked at Boyd, um, you were a freshman, sophomore, junior, and now you're a senior. Yes, sir. And uh, we never crossed paths, so <laughs> this is a, a shame. I, um, when I was teaching theater, we would have loved to have a guy like you who's willing to put on a costume. And you got a great face for it, oh, too. Thank you, That's sir. Awesome. Uh, so um, tell us a little about yourself. I know your, your dad's a teacher, right? Uh, yes, sir. My dad teaches here at McKinney Boyd. He's the anatomy teacher. Uh, my mom uh, teaches at Edens. And she's a fifth grade teacher as well. And then I have my aunt that also teaches at Dow. Uh, I've got two sisters at home. And uh, a lot of my family is now moving up to McKinney. So we're getting pretty close and everything. So we're pretty good here. That's pretty awesome. Good. Now, tell me a little bit about yourself. What, what do you like to do besides the Civil War reenactment? I actually prefer, I actually like to go and play golf every now and then. I um, really used to be on the uh, golf team here at McKinney Boyd. Yeah. I uh, did that for quite a while. This year, I've actually joined yearbook staff. So this year, I'm working on the yearbook for McKinney Boyd, which I'm pretty excited to get to do. It, it's a lot of fun. You get to go out and take pictures and kind of gives me an experience of, uh, you know, getting to experience the journalism side and then it kind of ties in a little bit with my Civil War acting, as in, because I think back to the old Brady pictures of Civil War photos that people would take, and I found that yeah. as a really interesting way to go and do it and write up stories about it. That's awesome. Well, I know we've got some photographs we're going to see here in a little bit of some of the events and, and those types of photos that you, you're describing. Um, tell us how you got into this. I mean, you are into this, because <laughs> this is an awesome, awesome outfit. Uh, do you call it a costume, or do this you is call actually it a... A uniform. This is a uniform of the uh, 1st Texas uh, Regiment that came out and actually joined the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee. This is a little bit of a variant using a butternut color, which was very common in the South. They uh, figured out that if they couldn't get enough gray, they figured, well, we'll take boiling water and we'll put walnuts in it and we'll throw our white uniforms in it. When they came out, they came out this color. And they picked this one as their decide. And then the Texas decided to put on all these black pipings and the Texas state buttons on could actually make it look a little bit more sure where they so the people can know where they came from that's terrific now what uh, about what year are we talking about just for those of us back home that are like <laughs> this would have been the 1861 year that the uh, Texas U regiment decided to wear these and eventually it started becoming whatever the heck they could find at home and they just kind of threw it on and said all right we're gonna go find it off some guy if it's lying out in the field and wear it <laughs> and you said this is 100 percent wool yes sir uh, and then you got like a cotton um, Long we're, sleeve shirt underneath. We're cotton undershirt, and I mean everything else is cotton, but on the on the exterior, it's all wool. All mm -hmm. wool. And, and uh, what about the the leather boots you're wearing? These here? are actually brogans. These are the very first really non good shoe, <laughs> <laughs> made of just raw um, leather, and then you got wood, and then they would have a plate like a horseshoe on the yeah, bottom. It looks like and a horseshoe. And what that would do is it would keep you. Not only would it sound good when you're on parade and you're marching, so you have all the clicking shoes you'd also have when you fired, it would give you, keep you from falling back on recoil. That's great. But very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's terrific. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll see you have a belt buckle, too. This yes, sir. For the state of Texas, we had the, um, the star, Texas star for Texas. And uh, that's great. We state to wear it. <laughs> okay. And then uh, you brought some other items, too. We yes, sir. To check out here. Um, one is, this is an act, actual uh, 1860 cavalry saber. This would have been carried either by an officer or, in the case of anything else, this would be carried by a cavalry uh, uh, soldier. Whoa. This was uh, actually one of Robert E. Lee's favorites and Stonewall Jackson's favorites that he carried, especially during the Mexican-American War before he joined the Civil War for the South. But that is my version that I actually luckily got promoted to carry. Yeah. <laughs> as well as... Um, the pistol. The other thing I have here is a flag that I've taken up making. I've actually taken up making flags for the Civil War. This particular flag is the flag of the 2nd Kentucky Regiment. They actually fought as the part of the Orphan Brigade during the Civil War because Kentucky wasn't considered a part of the actual South. 
And actually, Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, didn't even put the star for Kentucky on the Confederate flag because he didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So this, they were considered the Orphan Brigade during the war because they joined the South for their cause. Well, and, and, you say, and you say that you had, um, uh, this is one that you made yourself. Yes, sir. That's and awesome. And painted everything, and my Nana helped me stitch everything on there, but uh, it takes about a week-long process. It's a, it's a complicated little deal. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No, that, that's terrific. Um, so, okay, how did, how did this interest, uh, I think you, you said it started about four years ago. Uh, how did this interest in Civil War uh, come about for you? Yes, sir. I uh, actually ended up going to a small event that the unit that I run in now, uh, they hold an event every April at Chestnut Square. It's usually about the 14th or 15th of April. But we go down there, and it's our own event. And I happened to be down there with one of my best friends one time, and I just went there to go see it, and I didn't think anything about it. And as soon as I got down there, and I saw it, and I saw the smoke, and I saw the, the fire, you know, and everything. I mean, I was just like, I got to do this. And, and within a week, I'd already called up our commander. My name is uh, Rodney Stell. I called him up, already joined the unit. Uh, in a week, I already was fully registered. By the end of the year, I had my first uniform, and I was gun ho into this. By now, I've got six uniforms at home now. Oh, so no it's kidding. Quite well, a hobby. <laughs> do we, maybe we have some pictures of you in other uniforms as well? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Got me a sergeant's uniform, I believe, and a couple of the other ones that I have. So, No kidding. Um, here's some. Okay, is this you there in the, uh, the middle? Yes, sir. Oh, that would be me. <laughs> Great. That was a long time ago, that picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sure, you're a little younger there. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and they have a different hat on as well. Yes, sir. That would be called the uh, bummer style hat that they would have worn during the war. They figured out that uh, the kepi actually is a shorter, and then they, a lot of the soldiers like to actually add the extra little flop over brim for it, which they preferred. But uh, Now, these uh, pictures are taken around uh, McKinney? Yes, sir. Chestnut Square downtown. It's uh, over off of Highway 5. And that uh, Stell, that's your... Yes, sir. That'd be, that's him right there. Okay. In the picture right there with me. Is he still involved with <laughs> yes, the sir. that you he's have a, here? And he's still out of the commander. That's a, there's an old friend of ours. Oh boy, I can just... Well, I mean, there's him, Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so talk to us a little bit about an event, um, whether it's here in McKinney or... Um, uh, you went to Jefferson, Texas? Uh, yes, sir, I did. I actually yeah. got to go... To my very first real big event after Chestnut was the event at um, Jefferson, Texas. And we had about, I'd say close to 500 to 1,000 people there. There was quite a few reenactors. Actually, that was my first time to actually put on the blue suit and actually be a union guy for once. But it was, <laughs> it was a whole lot of fun. I mean, it, it was, it's an experience when you get to do small events, but when you get to the big events and you're looking down a line of 500 guys on each side of you, and you pour one big volley into the enemy, and you just see that puff of smoke come out, and you go, oh my gosh, I don't see the crowd. I, I'm really in the war. I, you, I mean, I felt like I was yeah. really back then. I was sitting there going, well, yeah, I don't see no car. I just see a bunch of guys trying to shoot at me. I want to <laughs> keep going and keep firing back and hope that I get the best of luck and live. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it was, Jefferson was really good. They had a lot of, the big thing that really was cool to me was get to fire on line with artillery pieces. We got to fire with 10-pound Napoleons and uh, oh, okay. a lot of the big guns. And it was just a really... Really big experience just to finally get to see that. So you've, you've got this uh, saber, is yes, that right? Uh, do you have a musket as well? Yes, sir. I got an 1853 British pattern infield rifle that okay. they would have carried. And the, that was the standard issue of the Confederate Army because Britain was trading with the South for cotton. And it was easier for the Confederates to get a hold of these weapons than it was to take it from the Union Army, which was up in Springfield, uh, Illinois, I believe it was. So it was a little bit of an easier way for them to get a hold of weaponry, and that's what I intentionally got first. But um, it, it, I like it. It's, it's a good weapon. Is that the gun you're using in Jefferson? When you yes, sir. That is actually a lot of the pictures in at Jefferson. That's the one I carry. It, is okay. it, was my so, you were, so you're firing with a Confederate gun, mm -hmm. but you're wearing a Union mm -hmm. uniform. Um, but nobody know, knew that, yeah. of course. Well, but. that and most people, would they would take their own guns from home and go to war with them. Because if they didn't, if the Army couldn't supply them with a weapon, like the U.S. United States Army manual was the Springfield uh, 1861 musket, which is what most of them carried. But if they didn't have that, then you would go, home, go to war with whatever weapon you had at home. Or they would, um, if they end up, their musket ends up getting destroyed or stolen for any reason at all, then they would pick one off of a dead soldier that was lying on the ground and say, all right, I'm good to go. Let's go for the next round. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, now, how do you know when you're in the heat of the battle, how do you know when, what's supposed to happen? You know, the events, whether it's somebody gets uh, injured or somebody 
is killed or you're supposed to retreat. How do you know when those things come about? Best thing is, is when you're a private, you don't know anything. Your <laughs> officer takes care of everything. If he points his sword in a certain direction, then that's where you go. You follow where his sword says and what orders he gives out. If he says to hit to the left flank or fire to the left flank, then you fire to the left flank. If he says we need to retreat, then you hightail it out of there and you get next to the safest position you can find. It's mainly when, when you get into, when you get promoted into like sergeants, then you get to learn a little bit more the higher up you get. But when you're a private, it's just, you just lay around, and when they tell you to shoot at somebody, you go shoot at somebody. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, how do you, how do you fire one of these, uh, these guns? Well, actually, we fire a cartridge, and it doesn't, it's a blank cartridge. We poured about 65 grains of black powder in it. Uh, it has no bullet, because we don't want to really kill anybody. That'd be a really bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anywho, but they would, what they would do is you would take your musket, and you would tear off the cartridge with your teeth. And a lot of the soldiers, actually, during the war would pull out their teeth so they didn't have to go to war, because if you can't pull up the cartridge, you don't have to go to war, you can't fight. So you'd have to tear the cartridge, pour it down the barrel, take your thumb, stuff the bullet down into the barrel. You would produce your ramrod, flip it around, and you'd ram the home, round the uh, round home. Mm -hmm. You'd return the ramrod using your pinky so you didn't blow off your finger. Come down to the hammer, cock the hammer, put the cap, which would have a little bit of mercury and a little bit of gunpowder, put it on the nipple of the gun, go to full cock, and then you'd wait for the command to fire. When the command was given, you'd get ready, aim, fire, and then you'd pull the trigger. Good soldier could do that three times in one minute. Wow, that's terrific. So, um, when we, but when you guys go to battle, you just ignore the the bullet step. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah, else the is bullet. there, <laughs> but uh, so you're you're firing blanks essentially. Yes, sir. That's amazing. Well, tell us about the next big uh, event that you went to after Jefferson. Uh, after Jefferson, the next probably the next biggest one that I can think of was I did one actually out here at Myers Landing. They had one about a year ago. I did Myers Landing for a while. Uh, another one I've done was Beaumont Ranch down in Grandview, Texas. They had about 200 to 300 grand actors. And they had one guy that brought out a homemade Gatling gun that he had made at home. And that was a, that was a real big experience was to get to get shot at by that thing. Wow. <laughs> but, um, and then you went to um, the Battle of Wilson's Creek, right? Yes, sir. I just got, from, uh, got back in August from uh, Wilson's Creek. Oh, was, that's pretty recent then. Yes, yeah. sir. It was a... Big, big event, biggest event. I've first, my, my first national event I've been to. It was also 3,000 reenactors there. They had uh, about 200 cavalry and about, oh, I'd say 100 guns on the line. Okay, here we go. This is the one we have some video of. That's crazy. Now, from where the camera is sitting, do you think that's probably where um, your crowd is as far as watching the event? Yes, sir. They actually try to keep them out of distance of getting hit by anything that does end up kicking up or anything. Sure. But um, usually we do that in Chestnut Square because we're such a small unit. We, get a lot, we allow the people to come in closer so they can actually witness the event a little bit more so they can sure. see. And then they can come in and talk to us and get stories and be told how everything would work. And... Well, yeah, this is the best part, is actually getting to visit with you about mm -hmm. it. You know, not just watching the event take place, but, mm -hmm. but getting to, to learn about, um, you know, why uh, the things happened the way they did. Oh, no, this is yeah, in Chestnut. This is Chestnut right here. That's the... There we are. There's our... So you're on the far side here. You're in this group. Yes, sir. That's me over there on the uh, second to the right. Second to the right. There was a little guy back there. Yeah, he's our runner for the... Uh, it would be our messenger boy, so whenever the officer had to give commands to someone to take it back to the troops, he would hand him a letter, and then they would retreat. He would not so much retreat, just run back and give the orders to the next chain of command and say, we need reinforcements for him, or I'm being overrun, do something about it. Right. But, um, yes, sir. And that right there, actually, the Union unit right there, that is my um, other unit that I've joined. That is the 25th Iowa Regiment that I did Union with, and that's the boys that I went with to uh, Jefferson. Oh, really? Yes, sir. And this is the... This is our event that just the two of us hold every year. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, especially last year, we actually managed to, um, to get a couple other extra units to join us. So we had about 20 to 30 guys, and we're expecting this year to get them back, and we're hoping to get at least 50 this time. So it should be a good, really good event. Yeah. So we really can't wait for Chestnut Square again. Oh, someone went down there. But that was actually, we actually got booed for that, because that was their messenger. We got booed a lot for that. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, right on the far right, right there. Uh -huh. Oh, no kidding.
Wow. So. But it was, uh, it's very theatrical to me. That's mm -hmm. where I can make the connection with it. Is just it, it, how much of it do you feel like you know ahead of time is going to happen, and how much is it improvisational? Usually we know most of what's going to happen, and then you, it's also kind of like yourself. You're going to know what you need to do. If, some, if, you, know, like, if you know that this is going to happen, okay, well then I need to act this way. Or if we're going to end up getting beaten back, we need to retreat, then we need to make it look like we're getting retreated. You know, mm -hmm. If we need to retreat and get out of there, we can. Or if we're taking ground and we're going to advance more and you know, push the enemy out, then we'll start hooping and hauling, give them the rebel yell and start running after them and everything, oh, fix bayonets yeah. the whole bit and just chase them out. That's <laughs> hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, okay, t tell us a, a little bit about what your plans are now. Uh, you like, I know you say you're looking forward to Chestnut. Um, is there another big event that you're looking the next at? Next one that I have is I actually have uh, Shiloh, which is the first weekend of April I'm going to for the 150th of Shiloh. Is that why you made the... Uh, yes, sir. It's actually part of the business was for this flag right here. Um, That's good. Get to do that one. Uh, and then actually at the... Uh, in October, I get to go to the 150th of Vicksburg. Where I actually get to command. I get to wear this uniform and command our troops at Vicksburg oh, for the 150th. Congratulations. So I'm pretty excited. Thank you, sir. And then, uh, but 2013 is the big one. We got Gettysburg in July, and they're expecting over 30,000 reenactors to be there for that one. So we're really wow. pumped up for Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's great. That's great. Well, um, <clears throat> this is really, really cool. It's exciting. Thank and you, and you, your your knowledge of um, the the events, the the uh, the w inner workings mm -hmm. of the, the actual uh, fighting that went on is really remarkable. Um, is this what you want to continue to do in the future? Not, not specifically the reenactments, but, but this kind yes, of sir. education. I do. I actually am looking toward, uh, I'm actually looking at going to college and getting my degree in, in first in American history because I want to I be able to teach and everything on the American history level. And then I'm also looking at going into teaching at the college that I go to and attend and teach as a professor and then kind of work my way down to high school, then middle school and elementary. But it's kind of, I just love history. I've, I've also recently joined a World War II reenacting unit and I'm gonna start doing World War II as well so I can get a little bit more different yeah, scale absolutely. of warfare so I can still teach, but then I can also like go, well, I can give you information on this and I can figure it on this too. So I'll be able to teach you everything. So, yeah. But well, it's, just, it's just something I find that's really just interesting to me. and. A lot of people don't think it is, but I mean, I sit there and I go, my gosh, this is cool. And especially when you get to look up genealogy and look at my family tree and go, he fought here, he fought here. Oh my gosh, this is cool. I knew someone that was in the war. And yeah. It's just an interesting thing to get to learn. Well, I love listening to you talk about it. So <laughs> I, I definitely think you're going on the right, down the right path uh, of education. So best of luck sure. to you. Well, stay on the couch. And uh, right. it was very nice to meet you too, Sam. Very nice to meet you.